I would like to take as a text for our reflection this afternoon the first part of the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 7, verse 16, where Jesus said, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Ye shall know them by their fruits. I have to tell you that it's a strange and a fearsome thing to stand before you as one with whom it has been entrusted to tell the story of a person's life, to encapsulate the life of someone who touched as many lives and changed her world as much as Maxine Duster did would be impossible, even in the best of circumstances. And then her children told me, you've got 13 minutes to do it. <laughs> Lord have mercy on me. Sometimes being a preacher is a little bit like being the hero of a high-stakes action movie. Can he complete the mission before time runs out? And to make things a little more complicated for your preacher today, I never had the honor of meeting Maxine Duster personally. I know her primarily through her children, Michelle, Daniel, and David. But I want to tell you that that is knowing her enough. Because the scripture you just heard says that ye shall know them by their fruits. You see, excellent fruits tell the whole story of an excellent tree. Nobody can really know the soul of an artist except through seeing her art. Nobody knows the face of the creator except by seeing her creation. And we are gathered here to witness Maxine's artistry in the forms of lives. Not only the lives of her children, but of all who were touched by her and are gathered today. If you take a moment to look around yourself this afternoon, you will see people whose stories were indelibly marked by Maxine. And those marks are a living eulogy that we will each carry with us. One of these marks was pointed out to me in the planning process for this celebration service. Michelle struggled with how to list the names on the back of the bulletin because the majority of people here carry titles such as PhD and MD and JD. And I would wager that there is a higher density of credentials and degrees and honorifics in Maxine's phone book and in this gathering than there is in the entire U.S. Congress. <laughs> Not that it's a fair comparison. My point is that this is not an accident, is it? Ye shall know them by their fruits. Maxine inspired those around her to excellence because she herself was gold that had been refined by fire. The woman we know as Maxine Duster was born in the freedman's town of Pelham, Texas on August 23, 1939 to the name of Danny Maxine Porter. But she wanted you to know that her name was Maxine her name was more than just a name for her. It was a symbol of her personal power and sovereignty. When she married Donald Duster in 1962, it was a time when most new wives would have been rechristened by society as the Mrs. Donald Duster. But Maxine resisted that erasure insisting on being known and addressed as Maxine. She told her daughter Michelle about why this was so important to her. She said, you can't lose your name. You can't lose your name. I love this wisdom because we are all besieged by a world that wants to erase our names. The world tries to name us poor and rich educated or uneducated, American or immigrant or foreigner, beautiful or ugly, underqualified or overqualified, black or brown or white or other. The world tries to wash us 
into names that identify us with patterns of consumerism. How we shop, and how we vote, and how we talk, and how we look. It takes vigorous and courageous and conscientious effort to tell this world, you will not take away my name. And this is exactly what Maxine did. There's so much more to a name than just a collection of vowels and consonants. A name contains and expresses the values and the accomplishments and all the impact of a person's life. So when we call out Maxine's name, you know as well as I do that there is a world in that name. Fierce independence was in her name. She valued her liberation so highly that when she watched the musical Grease, she told her children how disappointed she was by the end. <laughs> because she hated seeing Sandy give up everything, give up her independence, just to follow some man into the sky. <laughs> Maxine was an example of a woman who was fully a wife to her husband and a mother to her children and yet never allowed her name to be overtaken by those roles. Throughout her life, she maintained her own life and interests that were outside of her family. Her bridge club, her tennis, her academic pursuits, her loves of art and beauty, her love of her heritage and culture. Let me put it this way. Her life was defined by her family, but it was never confined to her family. And because of that, she gave her children an ability to see themselves as more than the circumstances that the world placed upon them. They could always imagine themselves as more, could always reach to greater heights and frontiers. Their circumstances may, in some sense, define them but no child of Maxine's would ever be confined by them. And Maxine, of course, she didn't only impact her children this way. She impacted the lives of countless young children. Children who learned to master English under her care. She was a leader of the Chicago Focus Preceptorship Program, which we've heard about, where participants under her care went on to become doctors. She had this gift for inspiring people to be the most excellent versions of themselves. I would even say that she had a vocation for it. And that's just a churchy way of saying that it was her soul's purpose to inspire excellence. It was just in her name. In particular, she wanted to see black people succeed. Sometimes people try to make a name for themselves that surpasses where they came from. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Some folks see excellence and achievement as ways to abandon their heritage. But that was not the way for Maxine. She was in love with her heritage and with her people. She was devoted to making sure that black children knew that black pride was a virtue. As with most things, this teaching started with her children. Maxine worked hard to make sure that her children encountered black history and stories growing up. She understood the importance of making sure that their home environment was filled with symbols of the beauty and the greatness of blackness. The details matter. And in Maxine's household, the Christmas ornaments were black Santa and black angels. The songs at Christmas time were jazz and blues and R&B carols. And I think that if Frank Sinatra was ever heard in that house, he was probably the token white singer to ensure a diverse representation. <laughs> Maxine and Donald loved high culture, and they wanted their children to be as refined as they were. Donald would take them to the Art Institute, and Maxine would take them to Dusada. They learned the difference between Brie cheese and Gruyere. 
They listened to classical music and opera, and they learned to be conversant in international affairs. They learned the skills of being political, of making connections, and most of all, of making a name for themselves. In other words, Maxine and Donald were devoted to cultivating good fruit. And to say they were successful would be an understatement. Maybe you missed the photos of Michelle and Dan standing next to President Biden and Vice President Harris as the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act was signed into law. That moment was no accident. It was the product of long and loving cultivation. In some ways, it was the gift of a matriarch who wanted her children to have their own names, to be able to stand next to power and to stand up to power when necessary. In a family where anyone could cruise through the world just by accepting the name the great-grandchild of Ida B. Wells, or for that matter, the daughter of the great Maxine Duster, it takes intention to be a fruit of your own flavor. And yet here you are, her children, and many others who were formed by Maxine Duster's loving cultivation, fully and fabulously yourselves, formed in your own name, Bankers, authors, doctors, attorneys, coaches, public speakers, parents, graduates, and perhaps most profound and admirable of all the professions, the mothers and the women who have quietly been keeping us all alive and holding our world together. Proud in your names. Maxine's legacy is strong in the room before me. She was a woman who had no patience for inferiority complexes or self-pity or fatalism. And she hated to see wasted time and talent. She devoted herself to giving people the opportunities they needed to be the most excellent versions of themselves. I love the way that Michelle illustrated this for us. She used to love going shopping with her mother. Maxine's favorite place to look for prizes were the secondhand stores and the discounted clothing racks. Not because she was cheap, and definitely not because she was lacking for good taste. A woman who sits her children down to teach them the difference between brie and gruyere is not a woman with a shortage of taste. But she loved these things because she delighted in finding things that had potential. As Michelle said, garments of good workmanship. And she taught her children how to identify and buy high quality, how to work with a tailor, and how to bring out the best and the brightest potential of every garment. She was the same way with people. When Maxine looked at you, she didn't just see your circumstances. She didn't just see an undervalued price tag. She knew how to identify a pearl of great price that was buried in a field, as the scripture says. And she knew how to set it in a place where its beauty and its glory could shine. Ye shall know them by their fruits. That is what Jesus said. And what I see before me is a room full of good fruits. But this eulogy would not be complete if I left you believing that good fruit was all about excellence and achievement. It is even more about being excellent in your joy, being excellent in your gratitude, being excellent in your love. Because these were the brightest and the sweetest fruits of Maxine's life. And I hope to see some of those fruits come alive today. And so in the immortal words of Fred Hammond, which we will hear momentarily, let's get into it. In honor of Maxine's lifetime of cultivating us, 
Let us bear fruits of joy. Let us bear fruits of love. So come, beloved of Maxine, and let us dance. Amen. Amen.